appreciate the invitation. And um, I didn't realize that you were all missing class for this. I thought this was just a little lunch, to be honest. So you're missing class, so that kind of raises the bar. I'll try to be even more uh, fantastic, more intellectual, probe you, ask you questions, but basically at the end to justify that. Um, your teacher tells me that you're all in, uh, AP government, so you guys are in deep for all this stuff, and it's a lot of work at AP class, and uh, hope you do well on the exam in the spring, uh, not only because seniors, as you probably guessed, tend to become a little lazy as the year goes on, and suddenly those AP tests are in front of you, and uh, you, you don't want to have spent all this time studying really hard to do poorly on that test. That's one reason. The second reason is uh, college credit is really helpful, and you're all in the pros, I'm guessing, when applying to colleges. So having those three credits uh, in your back pocket can be really useful, not only because it allows you to start at a higher level if you decide to study government politics in college, uh, but it also can you start college with, with uh, being ahead of the game. It's going to be really useful a few years from now when you're thinking of what you're going to do after college. I don't want to get too far ahead of your lives, but uh, as your teacher will tell you, it all happens really very, very quickly. So uh, good luck with all of that. I uh, just want to make a few comments, and I really want to hear from you. I want to take questions about the recent elections in Massachusetts, the recent elections nationwide, anything that's happening in terms of current events that you're thinking about, that you're you're struggling with, and then also, you know, since you are all seniors, uh, any questions you have about studying this in college and what people do with it and navigating <clears throat> that particular process, which is going to be in front of you uh, pretty soon. So, let me just uh, state at the outset uh, in terms of the election, what I would like to encourage you to do um, is to, to think differently about any one election. We live in a media environment that really demands that we have kind of instantaneous thought about any political phenomenon that really happens. Uh, when the reality is uh, people uh, really should take a step back and think about the broad sweep of American politics before they try to uh, make a judgment about that which they're seeing. So the way I like to think about elections is like a mosaic. I don't know if any of you have seen, have you seen a mosaic, right? If you get up really close to a mosaic, what do you see? Right, you see small little pieces tile, whatever they've made the mosaic out of, a small little piece. And that is what any one American election is like. It is a small, tiny little piece in a much larger story. And the only way that you can fully appreciate the story, like the mosaic, is to take a few steps back, right, and view the whole. There are a lot of people in our current media environment and in our information age that would like to believe that the results of any one election tells you everything that you need to know, right? Uh, simply not accurate. So here's some things to throw out there. Uh, if, you've, if you've been paying attention to the election results and then the aftermath, uh, which is usually just a lot of, of hot air being thrown about by some journalists who are a little lazier than they should be or know better, um, uh, or people on the radio, people on, on television, they have to make a story out of something, right? Or else it's kind of boring TV. <laughs> usually though, they're, they're, they're making a story out of, out of nothing. Here's the fact. Every American president, going back to 1918, who has been re-elected to a second term, has faced an opposition Congress during the last two years. All of them, except for one, Franklin Roosevelt, which as you probably know, his presidency is a bit of an anomaly. Depression, four terms, a war, right? So Franklin Roosevelt's not a model for what happens more often than not. But even during the last two years of his second term, he didn't lose control of Congress, but the Republican Party made a roaring comeback and really frustrated him for the rest of his presidency. So what President Obama is experiencing is really not that unusual. Now the reasons for it change from time to time. There are different political issues now than there were in 1918, but every president going back to Woodrow Wilson has confronted an opposition-controlled Congress. They've either lost control of Congress during their last two years, or they failed to regain control of Congress. Their party failed to regain control of Congress. So there's that. Secondly, uh, if you studied Massachusetts politics, paid any election to it, uh, any attention to it, rather, um, what happened two weeks ago really returns Massachusetts to a state of normalcy, which is not a word, but President Harding liked it, so I like it. Right? 
Massachusetts has, since it went to a four-year term for governors back in the late 1960s, has uh, elected a Republican to the governor's office 50% of the time. So any Republican running for governor in Massachusetts has a 50-50 shot that way. It is really not that unusual. Now, I paid close attention to what some folks in Washington have to say. By the way, I love Washington. Uh, if there's any place outside of New England that I could imagine myself so a lot of respect for it. I love the city. It is a great place to go, uh, to visit, to study, to live. So when I say people in Washington, D.C., I'm not simply using that as a pejorative to like a lot of what they do. But in our modern media environment, it's very easy for them to draw conclusions that are simply inaccurate. So a lot of folks are saying, the well, Republicans did really well two weeks ago, which they did. And as evidence of that, they won in places they don't normally win in, like Massachusetts. But it's simply false. 50% of the time, going back to 1966, Republicans have won the governor's office. There have been more individuals who are Republican as governor in Massachusetts since 1966 than there have been Democrats. And they've won half of the elections. In fact, a Republican won a higher percentage of the vote than any other person ever in Massachusetts history when he ran for re-election Bill Weld in 1994, he won 71% of the vote back. This is a state that is actually quite open to electing a certain kind of Republican to a certain office, fairly moderate, business-oriented Republican to the governor's office. And we do it with a good degree of frequency. Now, everywhere else in this state, the Republican Party is, uh, I don't mean to offend you if you're a Republican, it's not your fault, it, it's completely insignificant. They can't win many seats in the legislature. They have, does anyone know how many seats in the state senate they have? There are 40 state senators. How many seats do they have? Four. How many seats will they have once the new senate takes office? Six. Six. Just think about that. They have six out of 40. Um, they could fit around in no kind of car you drive. The chances are good. You could put all the Republican senate members in your car right, and just drive them from place to place. They actually joke about that. I, I think they cry on the inside, but ultimately <laughs> they, they do joke about that. We could drive around in our Prius all over, all over the state trying to find new Republicans. In the state House of Representatives, out of 160 members, they have 30, 30 something, 30 and change, right? We don't really need to remember, just remember it's insignificant. They have 30, they have 50, doesn't matter. Uh, that is an overwhelming minority in the legislature. So that is an interesting story. And because of that, some folks in Washington or elsewhere, if they're being lazy, think, oh, that state's not open to Republicans. But you know, we are, just a certain kind, a certain place. And I think from, a, from my perspective as a political scientist, I find that really interesting, why Republicans can do so well winning the governor's office, but they cannot win anywhere else. They haven't won other state constitutional offices. We know what those are. We have governor and lieutenant governor. They run as a pair. And we have attorney general, treasurer, secretary of state, and state auditor. Those are the, the, other, the four other constitutional offices that we elect statewide. So there are four others outside of governor and lieutenant governor. We elect them every four years. Since 1966, when we went to four-year terms, how many of those other offices have been won by Republicans? Anyone know? How many times do you think a Republican has won? Going back to 66. It's a lot of elections, four up every four years, right? Take a guess. Ten. Three. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? No, no, you're supposed to say I knew it. I mean, I knew it. Say I knew it. That's right. They won once in 1966, they won Attorney General, and twice in 1990 and 1994, they won State Treasurer. And that's it. That is, that's pretty bad. Right? But also, you know, my, my point isn't of good, bad, or ugly. Um, I just find it really interesting and something to think about and to kind of explore and figure out. What's going on here in Massachusetts, where we often have this one office that's really successfully contested, and then all these other offices um, are not. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, take your, your questions on that as well. 
So those are kind of two little things that are, that are a little bit more boring than what you're probably used to if you're paying attention to national news, which is trying to make a big deal out of something that, at least in Massachusetts, is kind of normal and not really that newsworthy. That's not a, uh, to take away from the significance of any one election. It just means when we step back and we look at Massachusetts in the new year, and we see a Republican governor in the Democratic legislature, I look at that and say, yeah, it seems about right. It seems about normal. It's been that way my whole life. It's been that way for a good part of your lives. Right? That's kind of the way it is in the state. Nationally, when we look at the Congress and we see uh, overwhelming Republican control now in the House and the Senate, good control in the Senate, uh, we see a Democratic president. Again, it doesn't strike me as odd. Uh, all presidents who've re been reelected have confronted that. There is something different about what's going on in D.C. today um, than we've seen in years past, mostly because uh, we have developed a political system which is complicated to begin with because of the constitutional checks and balances and federalism and all these layers, right? It makes it difficult to get anything done under really good circumstances. We have added to that within our two parties, particularly within one, uh, a caucus of folks who really aren't interested in getting anything done. Now that's a, that's a political issue that we as a country have to confront that's really hard to get at and to fix if you think it needs fixing. Um, while it's not unusual that the president would face an opposition-controlled Congress, it is a little bit unusual that he faces one uh, that is hostile to actually kind of doing much of anything down in Washington. That is something new. Usually people, even, even conservatives who you might think quite reasonably, don't want government doing a lot. Uh, the degree to which they don't wish to do anything is a modern phenomenon. The degree to which they want to prevent anything from happening is something that is new. And there are some political reasons for that that I'd love to kind of explore with you if you're, if you're interested. So again, that, that is a new kind of development in our politics. It's been around for the past eight years, but a little bit longer than that. Uh, that, is, that is frustrating uh, for those of us who study it, in part because my interest in politics and government extends beyond who's in, who's out, who wins, who loses. I find all that interesting, and it's I like the competitiveness of it. Right? There's a sports aspect to politics that that keeps a lot of people interesting. It's entertaining, it's competitive, but I'm interested in a little bit more than that. I'm also interested in, in citizenship and how you understand government, how you are involved in government. Typically, the reality is you're not involved at all. Um, you're all seniors, so some of you probably old enough to vote two weeks ago. You don't need to show your names. Um, hoping that the number would be high, simply because you're AP government students and you know, you think you might like to do that. Uh, but the reality is, most of our fellow citizens do not participate um, at all. They don't vote uh, at any level. We ask a lot of our citizens in the United States, right, in many other Western democracies. You might go and vote in a national election and then not vote again for five to seven years, depending on the system. In the United States, we really ask a lot of our citizens. We want them to vote every two years for the House, every four for president, every six for your senator, and usually those are staggered within a state, so you're voting often. And then you're voting for all of those state offices, governor and lieutenant governor, the ones I listed, but does anyone know what the state auditor does? It's not a trick question. Um, Many people don't, right? There may be some who do. That was a rhetorical question in part, to make a larger point. Most people don't know, only because um, they're not stupid, as some professors at MIT seem to think. They are actually you know, busy with their lives, with their families, with their jobs. It's not unreasonable to think on a daily basis you're thinking about your school, your family, your friends, your job, your team, and maybe not devoting all of your time and attention to thinking, what does the state auditor do? So let me investigate what that what that office. My wife is both a teacher and an athlete. She's a triathlete. I think that's a little crazy, but that's her thing, right? And she she tolerates my interest in politics, right? Um, she thinks that's nice. That thing that I do, is nice. <laughs> but she's you know she's probably more like the rest of the country, meaning smart, capable, good, but this isn't her driving passion. So not only do we have to think about all those offices, you've got your state offices, your, your state legislature, your state senator, your state rep, and then uh, your local town offices. So you have town government here, you have a town meeting in Pembroke. And that's, a, that's a lot to ask for. It really is. 
And, and it's not to let you off the hook for not participating, it's just to suggest that most of our fellow citizens, because of that, and for lots of other reasons, have decided they don't want any part of that. And that's become a real problem. Uh, tens of millions of our fellow citizens routinely do not participate at all. They don't vote in the presidential election. If you don't vote in the presidential election, you are not voting in a local election. It's not even close. If you vote in a local election, you're probably voting in the presidential election. But for most of our fellow citizens, they have tuned out. It's a real problem if you believe that, on some level, a democracy ought to be based on you know, citizen participation. And so um, that's something I'm interested in as well as political scientists, and I'm happy to uh, talk to all of you about. So I, I've thrown some big things out there. Um, I'm happy to kind of take your questions and engage you in conversation on the things that you find interesting. Um, anything about Massachusetts national politics, or again, you know, you're about to enter an exciting new chapter in your life. I have to talk about that too. Yeah. Um, what do you think the best way to involve more people in voting would be? You know, I don't know. I wish I had that one because I, absent that, I really don't know what the answer is. There are things that we can do that we know will increase turnout. So, same day voter registration. Everywhere it's happened, the number of people who turn out increases. It is, it is not so difficult, but the reality is elections, we have national elections that are run through local town clerk offices. So we have this, this kind of mismatch. We, right? Elections are run, we really don't have anything like a national election. What we have are thousands of little local elections that feed into our national politics. The reason I raise that is, and it's a principle of federalism, right? It's one of those functions that localities and states control, is there's wide disparity across the country on town clerk offices and their resources and their capabilities. There is simply no reason in the year 2014 that we can't have the same day voter registration. There really isn't, technologically speaking, right? The things that you can do on your phone, if you hadn't been told to turn them off, you'd be doing them right now, probably, right? The things that you can do on that phone, just absolutely amazing. Probably not amazing to you, because it's your life. Like my, I have a 13, 12 year old, 9 year old. I might as well be 150 when I talk about technology. I didn't have a cell phone until I was an adult, because <laughs> just for one unnecessary event, uh, that was unusual. Yeah. Um, but the reason, some of the reasons we don't have them is because we have these local town clerk offices, they're not swimming in money to do it. It takes some effort to get it done, but we could do it. And if we had same-day voter registration, uh, turnout would be higher. Just think of yourself, maybe, the, maybe you're not the best, you're not a representative sample. Think about people you know who are not really interested in politics. When do people start paying attention to an election? Yeah. When it affects them personally. Okay, for one, when it affects them personally, but also in terms of the calendar. You think of the calendar of American elections, which seems to go on forever. What are people really interested in? Um, I don't know if I can give you like a date, but like when you start seeing the things on TV and if okay. you get the phone calls and stuff. All right, start getting those. People start to perk up or tune out because I don't know if you want my, my nine year old huge Patriots fans who watch the game together. I got so sick of seeing ads for Scott Brown and Gene Shaheen. And you know, it's like I don't even live in New Hampshire, right? And of course my son, right. my son looks at me during these, these ads, which are almost uniformly poorly made and uh, negative, right? He was a big Scott Brown fan when Scott Brown was here, mostly because his older sister was a big Elizabeth Warren fan, so we had that going on. Right? He's never gotten over it. Um, so we have all these, these things about Scott Brown. I didn't know anything about Scott Brown, uh, but he hears what people say on TV. And then he looks at me, he's like, is that true? You know, I'm like, well, you know, kind of, maybe not really. And of course, you know, to a nine-year-old here, it's like, what the hell? What? Adults lying about other adults when I just want to watch Patriots games. So I turn the other adult in the room, the professor of politics, and he can't give me a straight answer. It's like, you know, it's abysmal. It's abysmal. Um, like he's lost for every reason. He's probably never going to participate in politics. He's like, if that's what it's all about, right? Mostly he's thinking, I can't believe anyone would say something mean about Scott Brown. <laughs> he wasn't happy when he lost again. Um, people tend to pay attention during the last few weeks of the race, right? Because people are rational. 
with their time. Unless you're like me, and this may apply to you, right? You're in this class, you may have a heightened level of awareness of it all, and you pay attention to the stuff, right? I mean, it's part of what I do is my job, so right, I, I pay attention to it. Most people, if you're a banker, if you're an investment banker, if you're a, a teacher of, of biology as opposed to AP government, right? If you are doing anything else that normal people do, the election's in November. I'm like, oh, pay attention to that when it comes around. So most people pay attention to those last two weeks. But if you're not registered to vote, it doesn't matter. You spend those last two weeks studying everything you want. It simply doesn't matter. You can't vote. So we know that that's one way to do it. But it's, it's an investment. And I think, without being overly critical, government has to make a lot of decisions about where it's going to put its money. And you'd be hard pressed to find in many cities and states around the country a legislature that says, no, we should do radically increase the budget for town clerks so we can have same day voter registration. Because there's two ways we can do that pull money from something else, people don't like that, or raise taxes, people really don't like that. So you were caught, it's going to take some kind of national effort. But when you ask voters to list their priorities, same day voter registration isn't, isn't in the top 20. What are people interested in education, things like that, or healthcare? They're not interested in it. So, so that's a little more pessimistic than I'd like, but I think it would it, 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 take a pretty big undertaking to, to change that reality. As far as a, a constitutional amendment to change voting to Saturdays and Sundays, like a lot of other, other developed nations, right. I, I struggle to understand why we aren't voting on Saturdays and Sundays. I, I struggle to understand why in Massachusetts and some towns, like here in Pembroke, we have town elections in April and, right. and state and federal elections in November, November and not combining them. Yeah, I get it out. It's, it's, that's another thing. If you had municipal <coughs> elections, same time as national elections, voter uh, turnout would increase. Yeah, and though, you don't even need a constitutional amendment to do it. But whatever the hell you want, it just takes the legislature, it takes an act of Congress, right, um, at that level. But the state level, you know, we, could, we could move municipal elections at the same time as national elections. That would increase turnout. We could have it on a weekend over two days. I mean, I, you know, th these are these are not heavy lifts. Ultimately, these are things that would increase turnout, that would get more people where we are. But we we don't do it because we are also really quite conservative people. Why do we vote on Tuesdays? Because we vote on Tuesdays. Right. Move on. And the reality is also uh, who gets really exorcised about that. Not most people. Most people. Remember, you're too, too, too young to remember, but in the 2000 election, when George Bush lost the popular vote but won the uh, Electoral College vote, right? That rarely happens in history, but every now and then, right? It happens. And um, you'd think that people would be kind of frustrated by that. Not because the guy I didn't like won or the guy I like lost or whatever, but because Generally, you want the person who wins the popular vote to win the presidency. It's not such a radical idea. Um, but that act could not generate enough passion to do anything about it. So ultimately, uh, the Electoral College remains intact. That's a hard thing to do because it's in the Constitution. But also, states like Florida, I'm convinced Florida actually has no idea what they're doing. It comes to <laughs> and I guarantee you, in the next election, just pay attention to Florida and you know, type in the words Florida voter irregularities and something will occur and they just can't get their act together because voting is state and local and if the state chooses not to do much about it in an important electoral state like far you can end up in real life. Yes? How is it possible to win the popular vote and lose the vote? Right, yeah, it is, it is rare, but it is possible because the Constitution only declares that every state will determine the best, me best method for allocating its electoral votes. It is the Electoral College that elects the president. States choose to use the popular vote as the method for choosing their electors. But if you win a state, the popular vote in that state, even by the slimmest of margins, in most states, you win all of that state's electoral votes. So that creates some discrepancy there. You can, depending on how you line up the electoral college and which states you win, 
and then by how much in terms of the popular vote. It is possible, you can do it, you know, they have these handy dandy online electoral college maps, you can figure it out. You only need to win the state by one vote, right? His vote can move the state for Hillary Clinton or whoever the Republican nominee is gonna be, right? But in Massachusetts, that means all 11 electoral votes will go to the winner, even if you only win by one vote. Now, you replicate that out you know, across 50 states using various scenarios of the popular vote margins, and it's possible to win cleanly. George Bush won because Florida didn't know what the hell it was doing. But you can win clean, meaning you can win the Electoral College and lose the popular vote, even if every state knows what the heck it's doing, just by how you line up those popular vote margins. It's really rare. Right? And usually it occurs because the country is about split 50-50. The 2000 election is about as close as you're ever going to get to a 50-50 split. Someone's going to end up in the middle of office. It's pretty hard to do it the other way around, meaning you know, the country's 80-20 in favor of whomever, and, and the person gets 20% wins the Electoral College. But in a closely divided election, it's possible to do it. In 19, the only other example, 1976, which was pretty close, you know, had a certain percentage of people in Ohio, but it's always Ohio, moved the other way. Joe Ford would have been elected over Jimmy Carter, even though he would have lost a popular vote. Yes? So that like any motivation or like steps to get rid of the electoral vote to restore that popular Nothing of note, because, it's, it, because you have to have a constitutional amendment, and as you probably know, that's really hard to do. And again, there's only so much political oxygen in this. If you're a state legislature, and you're dealing with what state legislatures deal with, budgetary shortfalls, you need more money for education, health care, kind of big, important issues that affect you on a day-to-day -day basis, right? The electoral college kind of shrug your shoulders, we'll get to that. I've got, I've got a population of people who need health care, or a blizzard just hits Buffalo, you know, we don't have enough resources to deal with that. We have to put some resources there. But those are the kind of real life things that a legislature deals with. You say, well, let's spend some time thinking about the Electoral College. The what? Why would I spend any time, you know, why would I spend time dealing with something that is probably not going to happen because we need so many states to do the same thing? You know, so I think for good reasons, and let me don't be overly critical. I think there are good reasons why legislatures focus on the things that are right in front of them. Right, so uh, the Massachusetts budget is short this year by $325 million. All things considered, that's not a huge amount of money, but it's significant. And the legislature is going to deal with that. And so if you're that, you know, the kind of good, do good, reformist, good government type, comes in and says to the speaker, let's, let's have a conversation about the electoral college. I'm going to give you that look like, yeah, you get the hell out of my office. I've got real things to deal with. And I think that is why. Uh, there have been attempts in various states to try and allocate the electoral votes differently, so that instead of allocating them winner takes all, meaning you win Massachusetts by one vote, but you get 100% of the electoral votes, that they would allocate them based on um, the popular vote, which is one way of trying to get at it, to try and more properly align the Electoral College result with the popular vote result. Two, two states already do that, Nebraska and Maine. But of course, no one lives in those states, so it's kind of like, <laughs> you really need like California, New York, and Florida, and Ohio. If they started doing that, then you'd have a, a, a better alignment of Electoral College and popular vote. So are they the only two states that don't give you all the votes? Yeah, they only two, but in Maine it can only go do you know how many electoral votes the state has? Trivia question? Life is not made of trivia, so I don't really care if people get trivia right or wrong. I just find it interesting. By the way, I saw your teacher whisper in your ear, so this <laughs> better be 100% better be right. Six. Uh, in Maine? Oh, in Maine. Well, no, so that's wrong. <laughs> I told you not to say six. <laughs> told you not to say six. How many states, how do you know without knowing how many numbers they have? how any state gets to its number of electoral votes. There's a method. It's the number of uh, Congress people you have? That's right. It's the number of members of the House of Representatives you have in your state, which is based on population, plus two senators, right? So Massachusetts, we have nine members of the House, two senators, we have 11 electoral votes. Maine has two members of the House, right? Right. 
and two senators there, four wildlife like campaigns. California's got like 60, biggest in the union. So that's how you know. So you know those big states would really have to do something to make the allocation more fair. Um, what's your opinion on whether you think we should rewrite the Constitution or keep amending it? That's a big issue. That's a big issue. I mean, I think. Um, yeah, we had debate on that. What's that? We had a class debate on that. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Right. So you already know who won and lost the debate, so you kind of look at me thinking he's going to take my well, side. We, we kind of ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> we spent a long time. Should, well, you should. Kind of rewriting the Constitution is not a small undertaking. It was a vicious debate. Really... Well, it makes you feel better. The debates at the actual Constitutional Convention were really quite vicious as well. But they did, which, which you can't do, they decided to make the debates fairly secret. And then they went to the tavern every night to kind of soothe over their their hurt feelings. And it's a long, a long <laughs> summer that Philadelphia when they wrote the Constitution. You can't write a Constitution in open. That sounds kind of counterintuitive, but the reality is, um, the more people you let into the process, the more difficult the final product is going to be. If you even never get there, I don't think you can rewrite the Constitution. I don't. I'm not sure you want to. I do think the amendment process is the process that we use to rewrite it. Meaning, um, slavery was uh, embedded in the Constitution. You didn't need to rewrite the Constitution to get rid of it, you needed to amend the Constitution. So the 14th and 15th Amendments, the Constitution, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments Constitution, outlaw slavery, give uh, former slaves due process rights, you know, equality. Uh, and then the loss of the right to vote. So you can rewrite it by amending it. Rewriting it completely is a pretty large undertaking and fraught with a lot of difficulty. But I think you could you could fundamentally change the meaning of it by amending it. It's just that that's really hard to do. And it's one of the, the issues in our contemporary politics, which there are probably some areas the Constitution could do with an amendment or two, but it's, it's a real heavy lift. For the reasons that I noted earlier, it's just not high on everyone's, you know, you have to have kind of nationwide buy-in. And uh, it's just tough, tough, tough to do. But Abraham Lincoln, if you've studied him at all, uh, you should, uh, had some pretty definite opinions on the Constitution. And, and his view was, when you live in a country that is defined in part by the rule of law, then you have to abide by the Constitution. And Lincoln was kind of a moderate, would he be considered a moderate uh, today? He was considered a moderate at the time, not, not everyone saw that. Meaning, he, you know, he had the abolitionists on one slot side who wanted to pull out of the Union because there were slaves. He had the slaveholders on the other side who wanted to pull out of the Union because of the abolitionists. And, and he kind of stood in the middle and said, look, uh, in a democratic society, in the rule of law, you, you can't just decide not to live with each other and walk away. You gotta figure it out. You gotta, you got to govern yourselves by the rule of law, and if you don't like the law, you can't uh, uh, you can't decide to ignore it. You have to you have to change it. You have to fix it. And the Constitution lays out a process for doing that. Which is ultimately what you chose to do. I'm going to debate to listen to. Yeah. So just a question about the Massachusetts elections. Mm -hmm. Right now, to get on the ballot, a candidate has to get 50 percent of delegates votes at the convention. I was just wondering if you think that's a fair system or if they ought to change that. Well, so it's a very good question. Um, in order to be nominated by one of the two main political parties, you have to get 15% of the vote at the party's convention, right? Uh, there are other ways to get on the ballot. If you run as an independent, you just need signatures, a whole lot of them. Uh, but if you want to be the Democratic or Republican nominee, you both have to, you have to get 15% of the delegates at the convention then you have to win the primary in September, right? which is what the route that Martha Coakley uh, and others took. Two candidates in the Democratic Party were not on the ballot. Uh, Julia Kayyem and Joe Avalon. Two Democrats running at the convention in Worcester in June. They didn't get 15% of the votes of the Democrats who were assembled there. And a lot of folks were kind of upset by that because they thought those are two good candidates. Democrats should have let them on the ballot. 
I, I am, have always been a bit of a big believer in the 15% rule, but I also recognize the problems. I, mean, I, I like political parties. I like vibrant, active political parties. Uh, both parties, small parties, I think parties are important civic organizations as well as um, entities that link people to the government. So I, I'd like to see parties that are vibrant. One way, one way that parties can be vibrant is to give them a small amount of power. They don't have a lot, I know that we think that they do. Modern American political parties really are fundraising machines. They don't have a lot of power. Uh, they can't choose their own nominees, for example. Um, the 15% rule gives them a small amount of power. The, the trouble is, you, you can keep good people off the ballot. And so, for example, uh, I, you know, I think Julia Kayyem and Joe Avalon should have been on the ballot, but I'm not the Democratic Party, and I kind of recognize that parties should be able to, in some way, say what they stand for. And to say, uh, I don't, we don't want you as our nominee. You know, we don't think that you have the policies or the personality or whatever, the capability to govern. We don't want you to be our nominee. That leads them to some funny, you know, it's, it's funny to watch Democrats in particular, who you know, claim to be very inclusive, have a rule that also keeps people off the ballot. It's hard to maintain if you're an inclusive party if you have a rule that keeps people out. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I am also a big believer in parties that have uh, an understandable agenda and policy preferences. So we, we believe certain things, and we should have some role in choosing our own nominee. So I think it's complicated, but I also think it's one of those things like uh, the issue we were talking about earlier. There aren't enough people within the two parties who are upset by the 15% rule to do away with it. People who are really upset by the 15% rule are the ones whose candidates didn't win. And, of course, um, they don't have enough, right? The reason they didn't win is they couldn't get 15%. So they typically don't have enough people in the party who are so upset that they're willing to, to take down the 15% rule. Did you, were one of those two candidates? I yeah. yeah, I think she's great. I think she uh, would have been a really interesting nominee or governor. Uh, but you know, if she had 15%, she'd be there. If she didn't, I, I doubt it's going to amount to anything. And if you're Julia Kayyem and her people, think, are you really going to fight that fight? Probably not, if you want to be the Democratic nominee for something else at some point in the future. So it's going to be one of those things that people get upset about, but then, you know, they don't pay much attention to it. Um, you keep talking about uh, how some of these things aren't as high on the chain as they, they should be to make change. What are some of the things that are at, like the, towards the top? You said something about the top 20. What are some of the top five or most important? Issues that people are most concerned about. Yeah. If you ask, uh, and, and if you take public opinion polls, by the way, you need to do polling consistently to really figure it out. If you don't do it consistently, it's a small little snapshot that doesn't tell you much. Mm -hmm. But if you consistently poll people over time and ask them what are the big issue areas that they're concerned about, uh, Education is always high, always high. The economy, jobs, healthcare, right? Those are always toward the, toward the, the top. Uh, terrorism, and yeah, that ebbs and flows based on events elsewhere. Um, you know, if you were polling over the late summer into the fall, the Ebola thing would have been high, but it's, no one's talking about it now, right? Um, so that, that probably is not going to poll high at all. Transportation, poll people in Massachusetts, transportation ranks really high. I don't know if you have family members who work in Boston. If they do, I'm guessing transportation polls are pretty high because it's become a nightmare. It's always been bad. You know, cities, urban areas, suburban sprawl leads to transit problems. But uh, it's, it's really bad. I live on the Cape and we've got two bridges that are falling down. Right. If they do, that would be really problematic, right? For for uh, the economy there, right? For the whole, I mean, the economy would just collapse if you couldn't actually get people on and off the cave. But right now, you can't easily get people on and off the cave, right? They're at capacity, so you need, need a, new, a new bridge, two new bridges, or something. Uh, road work, you know, trains. It's it, we have not invested well in our transit in Massachusetts. 
And so that, that ranks pretty high as well. And you can see those are the kinds of things, you start looking at those issues, those affect you, they affect your families, they affect your friends, right? Now, today, the decisions that government has made about education, about transit, for the decisions they haven't made, impacts you right now. The Electoral College, 15% rule, which is not a government decision, although it is kind of because the state could change the laws there. Um, those don't impact people in the same way. They, they don't have a visceral reaction to it. Right? But if you ask even people who don't pay attention to politics or government, budgeting or public policy, ask them about the expressway. They know something about the expressway. Right? Or ask them about their local public schools. Why do they know something about their local public schools? It affects them, it affects their kids, but they pay for it directly. I know how much the town I live in, Sandwich, I know how much it costs me to support that public school because I pay quarterly property tax. I get the bill, I see the amount, I cringe, I write the check. I know exactly. I pay state income tax as well, but that goes to a whole host of programs, a whole range of things, harder for me to pinpoint. Now, not all of my property tax goes to fund the school, but in every locality, the biggest consumer of the local budget is the public school. So the number that I'm looking at also funds police and fire and lots of, but it doesn't fund at all because the state pays for some of that. But it's, it's, I can see it, right? Which is why you know, the gas tax strikes people right in their, in their gut. It's right an emotional thing, why? When you're filling up your car, it is staring right at you. You go out, next time you fill up your car, look at the cost, you know what's right there? What you're paying in tax. And as it's ringing up, you know, unless you're doing math really quickly, all you're thinking is I'm paying a hell of a lot. No, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, really aren't relative to other states, but it, it hits you right in your gut. So people who don't care about those things, or don't pay most, a lot of attention, there are some things like a gas tax or a property tax that they know a lot about because it really does impact them. Yeah? Uh, have you ever considered running for office or something, or do you think education is more your strong school? Uh, well, I hope it's my strong suit. <laughs> but no, I never have. It's really not my, it's not my thing. I hope that it's your thing. It, it needs to be somebody's thing. And um, if you've met a lot of people in public life, you probably walk out of the room thinking, that may not be the group of the brightest people I've ever met. And I don't say that to be overly critical. Some of them really are. <laughs> really passionate. We should always remember a few things about politicians, and I will encourage you never to fall in love with a politician. Not in your own personal life, but just, you know, people People sometimes look at a political leader and think, oh my god, that is the best thing ever. Right? People said that about President Obama. And um, caution you, because uh, they will break your heart over and over and over again. Not because they intend on it, but because they work and live in a system that was never designed to allow one politician to do whatever he or she would like to do. Okay. So President Obama is elected in 2008, and you could hear people fainting all over the country, the greatest politician ever. You know, maybe I'm just a little more pessimistic. I'm like, yeah, just wait. <laughs> people will break your heart. And you know who is really disappointed with him? His biggest support. Uh, and, you know, because I think sometimes they may have forgotten that we actually have a constitutional system of checks and balances, so Congress and courts and states. Presidents don't get to wave a magic wand. Um, and so, it doesn't, it's not what you asked me, so just, just an aside as you're, you know, thinking about who to get all emotional about, save it for someone else. Politicians will, will always break your heart. A little bit of wisdom. Maybe we're just getting old and increased. I don't think that's pessimistic. I just think that's realistic. It, there's, there's, a, there's a system that they have to operate in. I, I don't think they're all that. Like, I have a lot of respect that people do. Respect for President Bush, I respect President Obama. I've, I've known people, including some of my own students, who work for them. And I just think it's great. And there are multiple levels of way for you to get involved, including running for office. But we do need good people to run for office. Because the reason I started down this, don't fall in love with a politician, is no matter how savvy and good they are, no matter what their beliefs are, politicians are also people who are interested in power. 
and don't ever let them fool you. They don't get to do what they do without having it. They have to, in some way, want to have political power. And the framers of the Constitution understood that kind of aspect of human nature. There are people who want to have power. Some of those people want to use that power for really good things. Some of those people don't. Some of those people want to use that power for really good things and some things that aren't so good. And it is the duty of a citizen and the other institutions to check all of that. You don't want too many too powerful people. And so the reason I hope that you get involved at some level is, uh, and you'll think you become one of them, so I'd have to keep an eye on you as well, but we need smart, intelligent, savvy people to do it. Because if you don't, there are plenty of people out there who just want to have power and uh, will gladly run and win an election. Right? And they exist at the local, state, and national level. Um, how often do you think politicians, specifically in D.C., are pressured in vote, voting in certain ways on bills? That's a very good question. Um, so I don't know exactly. I'll just tell you what I, what I think to be true, which is we have, uh, our two political parties have changed over the past 50 years so that they used to be large big tent parties that had conservatives, moderates, and liberals in them. And, and that's kind of weird to think about, but that was the reality. The Democratic and Republican Party were really big organizations that had lots of internal disagreements. The reason I say that is because when, in, in years past, you'd find a lot of Republicans voting for a Democratic president's priorities, and a lot of Democrats, <coughs> excuse me, voting for a Republican president's priorities. And what you really had were liberals voting with liberals and conservatives voting with conservatives. The parties have changed over time, so the Democratic Party is not purely, but a very liberal party, or a liberal party. The Republican Party is a conservative party with a very conservative wing. So we find fewer Democrats and Republicans voting with the other, other party, so we see a lot of pure party voting. I don't think that's pressure, necessarily, uh, though we know that exists. But I think it is a, a reflection of the reality that liberals, more often than not, are going to vote with liberals, conservatives are going to more often than not vote with conservatives. Right? They don't necessarily need to be pressured into doing it. There are some votes that party leaders will try to exercise pressure, uh, and there are some things they can do. In Massachusetts, for example, uh, the, the Speaker of the House, if he, if he doesn't like you, and you don't vote with him, and you're in his caucus, he can throw your office out in the hall. It's rather uncomfortable. He cannot give you an office. Right? If you've been to the State House, it's kind of, kind of small. My state representative is a Republican. Um, so if you're a Republican in the Massachusetts state legislature, you are like, you're in the basement. Really, literally. So I happened to be in the state house one day, and he was newly elected, and I, he didn't know me, I didn't know him, but I saw him and thought, oh, I'll just go say hi. So he invited me, and he's like, go into the office. <clears throat> I felt really bad. <laughs> it was like a metal, table with a metal folding chair, right? And he, he's like, have a seat. And I'm like, this is... And it was cold. <laughs> metal table, metal folding chair in a cold office in the basement of the state house. And he kind of joked about it. He's like, I'm a newly elected Republican. He's like, I'm lucky to even have a door. And of course, the door to the office was, it wasn't a very big office, but there were four other state representatives in the office. So, it, that, Party leaders can use things like that to kind of get their way, and sometimes it's, it's successful, right? Other times there are members that would make their reputation. Senator Markey, who's been in public office forever, I count forever. If they've been in public office my entire life or most of it, that counts as forever. So he's been in public office forever. Uh, but he made his career by defying the Speaker of the House, getting thrown out into the office. And sometimes that works. You can, you can use that to now as U.S. Senator. Then. Um, but I don't, I, you know, there are some things that they need pressure, but other things it's just liberals vote for liberals and conservatives vote for conservatives. In this current Congress, though, you know, Republicans who want to vote with this president, there'll be a lot of pressure by their party leaders not to, because they're just, they, they really do are interested in butting heads, and that's it's unfortunate. But there are limits to what they can do. Unlike a British parliamentary system, you can't be thrown out of Congress if you don't vote the way your party leader wants you to. You can't be thrown out of your party. In a, in a parliamentary system, they can throw you out. 
and not run you in the next election, right? And literally throw you out of the party. But in our system, that in our constitutional system, you can't do that. Yes. Is it hard for the Democrats to get like bills and stuff passed if the Republicans control the Congress? It is impossible. In this Congress, right, it, it's almost impossible. If the House is more majoritarian, meaning the House runs by majority rule, so whichever party is in the majority gets to run the show. And uh, depending on the rules and depending on the leadership, uh, Democrats in the House are, in terms of getting a bill passed, powerless to do it on their own. So you have anything that gets passed in the House today, and it's very little, but it has to have a Republican sponsor to help shepherd it through the majority. The Senate is not a majoritarian institution. Even though one party or the other has a majority, that each individual senator has a significant amount of power relative to a single member of the House. So it, it is, you're more likely to see bipartisan initiatives happen in the Senate because one senator, does anyone know why that is? What's the, what's the term that we use? What is one thing that they can do in the Senate that they can't do in the House of Representatives? Filibuster. Do you know what that is? Have you heard the, the phrase filibuster? No. Okay. It's not a quiz. Nothing great. If you have 40 members of the Senate, you can um, filibuster something automatically and make it so that they don't even discuss the bill. And if you have even just one senator, you can just stand up there and talk for as long as you want and um, walk. Right. So filibuster means unlimited debate. So any one senator can stand up. It literally means that one sen senator stands up and talks nonstop and never yields the floor. Now, these people are, you know, that's no great courage. Right? Have you ever met a politician who couldn't talk about anything forever? Please. Um, I'll read three days in half. That's right. Senator Cruz, that wasn't even a real filibuster, that was a fake filibuster. They gave him the floor for a certain amount of time. He just chose to continue talking. He likes the sound of his own voice. Um, but a real filibuster is unlimited debate, meaning you never get to vote. And it has happened, it doesn't happen that often. The way it happens now is the senator just threatens it. And the only way you can cut off a filibuster is uh, with a vote of cloture. And it takes 60. So you don't have it, which is why a lot of times you see them passing a bill. They're not really passing a bill, but it failed because it didn't reach 60 votes. That's to prevent the filibuster. It's not actually on the merits of the bill itself. So any individual senator can do it, and a minority of the Senate can do it. Now that has prevented, in this current last few Congresses, a lot of stuff from happening. Because they, what used to be rare, the filibuster used to be pretty rare, has become much more common. And that's a real problem. But it is it gives each individual senator more power than an individual member of the House. If you were just elected two weeks ago and you are the Democratic member, the newly elected Democratic freshman from whatever state, you, know, you are the least powerful person in Washington, D.C. because the House is going to be run by the Republicans with a renewed majority. Right? And if you're the newly elected senator from whatever state, you're not as powerful, but you're much more powerful than that member of the House. Okay, time. So yeah, so we have our next class is okay. this class. So we can oh, keep okay, going. Great. If you if you want to keep going, we can keep if going. If you have questions, I'm happy to continue to take them. I need to cut you off. Or maybe that was the last question. Okay. Um, so right now in the legislature, it's hard for a bill to even get um, on, to even, even get up or down vote because of the committee system. Is there anything the legislature could do, in your opinion, to change that and make it so that more bills actually get voted on? Because right now they just kind of get pocketed. That's right. So uh, state legislatures, and ours is no exception, they have you know all bills flow through a committee process, and committees are typically run by pretty powerful members, the chair, and sometimes the chair has a lot of institutional devices to use to basically uh, send the bill off somewhere so that it never sees the light of day. Just sit on it. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could, you could experiment with, with you know, like, discharge visit petitions, you know, rules that would allow junior members to have more power over the legislative process. Problem with that, of course, is um, to get those rule changes through, you need to have the support of leadership, and leadership does not like to give up their power. So it's really, really tough. Individual committee chairs 
in the legislature are even more powerful than individual committee chairs in Congress because uh, when power is more local, it's actually more well hidden. Right, so do you even know, most people don't know, who are the, who are the relevant chairs in the, in the legislature? You are pretty savvy, pretty smart. Do you know who the most important chairs in the mess? Not you. <laughs> you, I suspect, already do know. But like other people, who are they? Now, the fact that she's raising her hand is good, for one, she's paying attention. The fact that you're not, all right, you know, give me my stern look. But I think the reality is, most of us don't know because it is not the first thing we're paying attention to. And secondly, uh, state and local journalism sucks. It, it, the newspapers of record, you, you probably, do you read newspapers? Do you read a daily newspaper, anyone? Yeah. No. Where do you get your news? Um, right, your phone. But like, where? Like on your phone. Like from what source? Twitter, Facebook. Twitter, Facebook. What? News. The news. Yeah. Right. You watch the news. My yeah. Mom, the, the 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 Herald, Boston Herald. Yeah. Right. I meant news. Star. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> yeah. So I mean. Um, that's where people get their news. That's where they get their information. Twitter is great, except Twitter is self-selected. Meaning, uh, um, it, what's that? You follow who you want. You follow who you want, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I'm a, I'm a horrible Twitter addict, so I have to I keep saying I'm going to take the app off. You, at least you have one. And then I don't. <laughs> we don't. We don't spend a lot of time on the news, and there's not a lot of news left. Meaning, the, the newspapers, are slimmer versions of themselves, they pull back, so they don't cover local politics very well at all. So if you read, even, you know, I read daily newspapers, I have them like from the 19th century. I have four newspapers delivered to my house and I read them. I also read a lot online, but I just, I like having the newspaper. Um, even if you read through the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald every day, there's a lot that you're not getting because they no longer have a journalist to cover it. It used to be we had daily newspapers in every major region of the state, sometimes two, morning and evening. Now in the digital media environment, you don't need that. You get your news number. But the news that you're getting is not covered by real journalists at the local level. And so it used to be in a, in a town like Pembroke back in the day, whatever, what's, it, what's the local, what's the major local paper for this area? The Reporter. The Mariner, the Mariner is the... The Mariner Reporter. It's is like it the Pembroke paper? Yeah. Is it yeah. weekly? Yeah. It's a weekly paper. There's usually, uh, in towns like this, you'd have a weekly paper and then a larger kind of daily newspaper that covered the towns around. That'd be like a ledger. The Patriot Ledger, right? Which used to be an evening newspaper. It used to be in the day that the, a, a paper like the Patriot Ledger had a journalist just covering Pembroke, just covering Kingston. Maybe they had two covering Plymouth. Right? That was their job. They no longer have it. If you read news in Pembroke, it's not from someone who knows anything about Pembroke, but something happened, they send a reporter down there to, to try and get at it. And the difference is, you used to be able to, you used to, be able to, to uh, get a lot of information about local politics that you can no longer get. And there are, there are really well-known journalists today who got their start, like I know a woman in, who's on the radio in Boston, she had her first journalism job covering the Sewer Commission in Fall River. Now, who the hell? The Sewer I can't think of an absolutely worst job. But you know what happens? A lot of money changes hands at Sewer Commission. A lot of money. And now no one covers it. No one covers the Sewer Commission. No one covers Fall River politics. Really? And they, just, and they used to have people then, the, the Patriot Ledger would also have someone at the State House covering your local legislative delegation. None of that is there. So it's a real dilemma on how, since you all get your news from Twitter, you're not getting a lot of actual hard news. You're getting some snark, you're getting some witty asides from somebody, you're getting the thing that Professor writes every now and then, right? You're getting what your friends are doing, uh, someone's Instagramming their food. Right? It's not really news. Sorry, I'll step off this little box. Says the Twitter addict, so I'm really a new place, new place to, uh, to judge. <laughs> Starting with Wayne, there's only so much you can talk about politics. You know, I have classes that sometimes meet two and a half hours. It's tough. 
it's not, it's not a straight line show with you. It's going to have much more interaction and a break, but two and a half hours of policy. It's only once a week. It's still an hour is a lot to digest. Any other presidents on tonight? You should pay attention. You won't be on the commercial networks with ratings. He is speaking to the nation today on immigration. Yeah? Who do you think is going to be in the Republican candidate for president? I have no idea. It's a wide open race. It's a wide, it doesn't usually happen that it's wide open. Typically, the Republican Party, if you look at history, they always tend to nominate the person who did really well the last time but just came up short. Right? So Mitt Romney in 2012 came in second, 2008. John McCain, 2008, came second. 2000, last time they competitive primary. They always tend to nominate the next in line. There is no next in line. And um, you have a lot of people who want it. So I think all the usual suspects, if you're paying attention to this thing, are all running. Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Chris Christie, Marco Rubio, maybe Jeff Bush, I know. Um, I think they're all running. And they are running, make no mistake, because the New Hampshire primary is in a year and two months. And that will it usually gets pushed up a little bit. So it's probably going to be in January 2016. That's just over a year from now. And it takes a whole heck of a lot of money to run for president. And it takes organization. You can't put these things together late. It takes tens of millions of dollars to make a run for it. And, and there's only so much really good talent out there in the states where you need it, right? And where do you need, where, the, where do you need talent in presidential elections? What are the important states? Well, Ohio in the general election, but in terms of getting to the nomination, right, to get to be the nominee of the Republican Democratic Party, which states are you going through? New Hampshire, New Hampshire Iowa. Iowa. That's where the early primary caucuses are. South Carolina, Nevada. Right, the president is going to sign an immigration executive order tomorrow in Nevada. They don't make these things up, right? There's a reason why he's not going to Springfield. Right, uh, lots of Hispanic voters in Nevada. It's really important to the Democratic Party. Right? Those are some of the early states. So there's only so much talent. And you need an organization in all those places. You need tens of million dollars to put together. So if you're going to run for the Republican nomination, this is the not so quiet phase, but I guarantee you all those people are running. And then there's the usual kind of you know, B and C team. You know, you know what to make this. Ben Carson is a doctor from Baltimore. Uh, Rick Santorum, former senator, tried last time. That's like the, Minor leagues, but they'll, they'll be running. Too. It's going to be a pretty crowded fight. Will Ben Romney run again? I seriously doubt it. You do not want to go down in history as the guy who lost three times in a row. And you know why? Right now, if you're Mitt Romney, so what I'm thinking, I mean, obviously, you know, I don't think like presidential candidates, so I, you know, I really don't know what goes through their minds. Um, but if you're Mitt Romney right now, you might be feeling pretty good, meaning you ran and you lost. But two years later, the country has turned against the president. And you're looking pretty good. Go around the country, you endorse all these people, and they win. And I'm thinking, do you want to squander that and run, try to run for president again? Because when pe people love you in politics, remember my, my, what I told you a moment ago, they will turn on you like that. Like that. You've never seen anything so vicious. And so Mitt Romney's riding high. As soon as he says I'm going to run for president again, three quarters of the Republicans will say, you're a loser. Get out of here. We don't want you. Right? And uh, you, know, you have thick skin when you're in politics, so you can handle that. But he's a real risk of not winning the nomination, and then winning the nomination and losing the general election again. And that, has, that, that just doesn't happen. Two general elections in a row to lose. He would, he would squander all the goodwill he has. Right now, he's like a kingmaker. He's got the golden touch. He goes to Iowa, he endorses the candidate, she wins. He goes to Colorado, endorses the candidate, wins. But the golden touch, can, you can lose that so fast. So I, I suspect, I can't imagine it's failing once again. It's a horrible, horrible fight. Why do people do it? You'd be president. I mean, <laughs> That's why you do it. But I think having lost twice, that's probably, and he's given no indication that he wants to. But here's the thing he is really well regarded. The people who like him really like him and really admire him. And if he decided to run, he could put together a pretty strong team pretty quickly and raise the money, right? But I don't think, I don't think the Republicans are going to want to give him the nomination. Okay. <coughs> Someone that ran three times and lost three times? 
Has someone ever run three times and lost three times? Yeah, like what he would do if he ran again and lost. Has uh, anyone done that? Not in the modern era. No. No. I mean, paren there are people who are perennial candidates, but not. no one of stature has run and lost for the presidency three times. Um, I mean, what do you do? I mean, if I, if that, if you, you, that's what you buy a house in the Caribbean and you never heard from again. Enjoy, <laughs> enjoy an existence somewhere, right? But you just, historically, I don't think Mitt Romney, I don't think he wants that to be his reputation. I think what he, rather, he is the guy who lost to the president. The president is now pretty unpopular. Romney's really popular. He is in a good place in his party. And whoever the Republican nominee is will want him to be around. Right? Want to pick his brain? He'll be an elder states person in his party, but that status you lose it immediately if you lose. Maybe Martha Coakley. Okay? Martha Coakley um, lost by forty thousand votes. That's the closest election in Massachusetts gubernatorial history since nineteen sixty four. Uh, forty thousand votes, fifty thousand vote change. He'd be you know the new governor. It's pretty close in a state that really elects likes Republican governors. She kept it that close. But the coverage of her has been abysmal. She's the worst candidate ever. She really wasn't. She really wasn't, objectively. She wasn't the greatest, but few are. When you lose, the narrative changes, and you have to have really thick skin to deal with that. Good people lose races. And then they're tagged as a loser. And you don't want to be a three time loser. Right? Martha Kofi will go off, she got a job in a law firm, which would be fun. Mitt Romney has the potential to be the most admired Republican in the country. Unless he runs for president. That's why I don't think that he knows that he'd be like me. And for those candidates that you said are like minor league, like, like are they running to get their name out there? But like, what's the point in them running? It's a really good question. I, I, I think. I, I, <laughs> I think there's some psychological issues. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> there are people do. There are people who do have delusions of grandeur. You know, they. And I think. I suppose any one of us. You say, do something, or someone comes up to you and says, uh, "Wow, that was really great. You should run for office." You ever thought of that? Get out of here. You go home and you sleep on it. Like, do it. State rep is a loser. I could do a better job than him. Maybe there's something to it, right? So a lot of people like that are surround themselves by people who who whisper in their ear, you know, you could be the next president. You could be the next president. I think for many of us, but particularly for politicians who want power and have been close to it, they they run the real risk of believing it when they believe that there's a pathway for them, even though the pathways never emerge. They think that it's possible. So this this doctor from Baltimore, Ben Carson, is not going to get anywhere close to the Republican nomination, but he's become really popular within a certain segment of the Republican Party, and so they keep you know trumpeting it to him, telling him how how we should make a run for it and how he's got a real shot. And, you know, what's the worst that can happen? No one expects you to win. You run, you raise your profile, you don't win. You get a TV show on Fox, you get a book deal. You live a very lucrative lifestyle in the aftermath. You may also be a national embarrassment at the same time, but who the hell cares? In this day and age, right, every national embarrassment gets its own TV show, her own TV show, <laughs> reality show. I mean, it's the Sarah Palin way of doing things. <laughs> you offer very little, uh, but you get, you know, she's, she's really laughing all the way to the back. That's a sad commentary on what would have been some people, but I suspect it's just part of that as well. Yes? Um, you know, going back to President Obama, what is his immigration policy? That he's well, it's not, it's, not real, it's not really a policy, it's an executive order. Um, so, presidents, this is going to be a hugely divisive debate when presidents issue executive orders on significant. Policy areas like this have become really divisive. Immigration is really divisive. My understanding, and this is what I read in the New York Times and Boston Globe this morning, which I would encourage you to do to follow up on this, is that he's going to issue an executive order. Presidents have uh, presidents are the top law enforcement official in the country. 
you know, law enforcement runs the executive branch. So in issues like deportation of people who are here unlawfully, the president has uh, the Department of Justice and his agencies, the Immigration Naturalization Service, that would change the name of that, but they're police agencies, essentially, that uh, deport people who are not here lawfully. Within the laws that govern deportations, there is discretion. We call it, at the local level, prosecutorial or police discretion. So, you all have been driving for a few years. Have any of you been pulled over for speeding and not been given a ticket? Now, you were speeding, right? So you were, in fact, breaking the law. <laughs> and the police officer pulls you over and runs your license, runs your plates, and do you tell you why you didn't give you a ticket? Well, I haven't had my license for very long. Yeah. That would be bad. I've been for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> about you? Do you tell you why? Uh, well, I will. You guys Dad's caught me. My uncle was a cop, and I have a really distinctive last name, so that was really useful to me at times. <laughs> Why were you not going to get? Um, I've never been pulled over before. All right, they used their discretion. You were acting unlawfully. The police officer used their discretion, didn't give you a ticket. We, prosecutors and police, use discretion all of the time. And the law allows them to do that. The laws that govern deportations similarly offer discretion. There are millions of people in this country illegal. There's a whole big debate about why. But they're here. And so you have to deport them if they're caught. The question is, how do you, as the, the frontline people who are dealing with this, decide who to deport and who not to deport? So do you deport uh, the, the, the child? Do you deport, deport the family? Do you deport someone who has been picked up because they were uh, engaged in criminal activity? So my understanding of what the executive order is, the president has already done some executive uh, order on this that declares that they are no longer going to be in the business of deporting families who have children who were born here. Because if you were born here, according to the Constitution, you're legal. You are an American citizen. He's going to extend that so that they are not, you know, breaking up families, and that they're going to focus on people who have been picked up for criminal activity. Now, discretion is built into the law. It actually is in what makes the laws work. You, you want discretion at all levels. You want police officers not coming down hard on someone who's got their license for the first time and is making a first time infraction. Now, you could you can just as easily say that that's exactly the kind of person we're going to come down hard on because you know, we want to be a reckless driver. But the reality is, the police officer has the discretion to decide. That police officer didn't do anything uh, illegally or unethically by deciding not to give him a ticket. So what the president is doing is executive action. Executive orders only apply to those things the president can control within the executive branch. The president can't issue an executive order abolishing the Department of Education. It's been congressionally enacted and budgeted. And the laws and the Constitution don't allow the president to do that. But in areas where the president already has discretion, the, the Constitution and the laws do allow him to do things there. The, the issue here is that what he's doing is really pretty big. We're talking about up to five million people that are no longer going to be uh, considered for deportation. So it's big, and you know immigration is divisive. And so it, you, you pull those things together, and it's going to be a pretty big um, debate. But when you hear people say the president's acting unconstitutionally, it, you gotta, you got to take a step back and, and ask yourself, what do they gain by saying that? And is it true? Is he really acting unconstitutionally? That doesn't, there's a difference between the president's making a mistake, I don't agree with this action, I don't think he should do it, and saying he's acting unlawfully or unconstitutionally. Because I don't think, again, given what I've read about what he's going to do, I don't think there's, that he is acting either unlawfully or unconstitutionally by, by issuing the executive order. But really, it will depend on the details. If he decided we're just going to stop deporting people, then that would be I would think an illegal executive action because Congress is mandating deportations. The laws 
mandate deportation. The president can't overturn a law with an executive order, but within those areas of discretion, he does have some room to move. Do you want to follow up on that? Yeah. yeah. So, the families that aren't being deported, say the parents came over here and had a child here, are the parents now considered American citizens? No. Not under this, you can't do that. If he attempted to do that, I would, I would tell you he's acting illegally and unconstitutionally. He cannot, he can't do that. Because there's a process for becoming a citizen. All of this does is delay deportation. Now, the hope would be, his hope would be that Congress would eventually get to the point where they're not going to deport these people at all and come up with a process for making them citizens. But, and, and the danger of an executive action is also the next president can undo it. It's not law. The next president, President Ted Cruz, comes into office and he, he rescinds it, and he will immediately. And then those people are back to the same status. It doesn't really change their legal definition, as far as I know. It just changes who they're going to go after, where they're going to focus their resources. Yeah. But, I mean, his critics will say this is a lead up to. Amnesty. Of course, it is amnesty in the sense that we're not going to deport them. But it, it doesn't provide them any kind of different legal status. Other than what you said with another president rescinding the order, is there another way to veto or block, per se, an executive order? So that's a really good question. In our system of checks and balances, um, there's always a rule, a room for the courts and Congress to play a role, or the states. That's how the system is designed to work. One institution does X, the other institution pushes back with Y. But with an executive order, it can be pretty tricky. Congress is going to try to do something, I would imagine. They're not going to be happy about this. Republicans in Congress, I'm sure. They're going, to, they're going to view it as the president kind of, you know, giving the middle finger on this issue. And in some ways, he probably is. He could have done this last year. You know, two weeks after the election, which they won, they're not going to take kindly to that. Well, what can they do about it? Well, Congress can cut the budget. You know, Congress controls the, 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 the budget. Congress can, can, they have some spending bills coming up to make the government run. You could shut the government down. <laughs> everything old is new again. You could shut the government down again. Um, they could defund something, but that, of course, is, would seem kind of silly because if you defund the people who are responsible for deporting uh, unlawful immigrants, then, then we'd actually not deport anybody, right? So they're, they're caught between a rock and a hard place. I do think they'll probably try to do something with the budget and, and make some cuts, but of course the president can veto that. You know, there's a lot of back and forth. Um, what they're more likely to do, I think that what they'd be more successful at doing is not giving him something else that he really wants. Say, look, you know, you didn't need to do that now, this immigration thing. You could have worked with us, by the way, I don't think that they would want to work with them on this, but that's what they'll say. You could have worked with us on that. Um, when you submit your, your priorities for the next Congress, you can pretty much kiss it all goodbye. If you're going to do that and you know, kind of stick your finger in our eye on this, and we're not going to give you a whole bunch of things that you really want. Is there always a lot of back and forth from the president, Congress, and the parties? Yeah, there is. There's always a lot of back and forth when, when, when they're not in different parties because they have different constituencies and they have different ways of viewing the world and they sit in different places. The president, no matter who the president is, sits in the White House. The president's the only person with a view of the whole, the only one subject to a national election. Members of Congress typically only care about the 600,000 people that are in their congressional district, half of which don't vote, right? And then, so you're dealing with a half of a half that actually vote for you. Those are the people you listen to. The, the, the Speaker of the House, he has a wider constituency. But ultimately, he's answerable to the people of his Ohio congressional district. Mm -hmm. you know, they're not. They're, the President and Congress always are always in a conflictual relationship because they see the world differently. Whether in the same party, in different parties. Sometimes, when the, the fights are worse when they're in the same party. These President Obama comes to office. In 2007, who the hell had ever heard of Barack Obama? You. <laughs> <laughs> but who else? Barack Obama? Are you got to be kidding me? 
So you're Democrats in Congress thinking, we just let someone no one's ever heard of. Could have been me. How'd that jackass get in there? Right? Well, he ran and, and had some other gifts. We need to call President China. I'm <laughs> saying what some members of Congress may have thought. If you look at the United States Senate, there are 100 senators. And the old joke in Washington is if we change the Constitution to allow the Senate to elect the president, we'd always have a 100 weight tie. Every senator thinks they're the next president. Everyone. They look in the mirror every morning and they see someone say, Hello, Mr. President, Madam President. Rarely happens until it does, and the guy who wins it, it just entered the Senate and no one ever heard of him. And so Demo and, and a lot of senators, a lot of members of Congress didn't like him because of that. You know, because it was someone else's turn. Hillary Clinton, for example, he stole it. And I mean, he didn't literally steal it, but you know, he, he was the one who won. A lot of internal divisions there. And um, sometimes things work better when there is a split control. So if you look back in history, split control of government, say from the Eisenhower years up through uh, before the second President Bush, a lot of good stuff happened when Congress was controlled by one party and the President was controlled by another. A lot of stuff happened. It is only in the modern era where very little happens. So something has changed. But the whole Nixon presidency, such as it was in Ford, split control of, of, of government. Most of the Reagan presidency, split control. The first President Bush, most of the Clinton presidency, split control. A lot of hatred, a lot of conflict, but a lot of legislation came through. Conservative, liberal legislation, right? They, they made it happen because a lot of people, I think John Boehner is one of them, but they didn't have the opportunity now. A lot of people at that level in Congress, these are, these are good people, they like to make a deal. Good politician, a really good politician, savvy political leader, they're all about making a deal. They'd like to sit around the table and figure these things out. John Boehner and Mitch McConnell, if they had their, the ability to, would like to be what we used to call gender specific, and I don't like the phrase, but man of the house. He'd like to be. John Boehner would like to be a man of the house. He'd love to sit around the table and make a deal. He doesn't like the president personally. The president does not like him personally. And they don't have a caucus. When you refer to a caucus, referring to party members. So the Republican caucus in the house is made up of all members of the Republican Party in the House of Representatives. There's a, a small segment of that that does not want John Boehner to be a man in the House, to, to make deals. And they don't, they don't let him. So he doesn't have the ability to. He would rather sit around the, the table and have the president say, this is what I want. Boehner says, this is what you're going to get. And they're going to find a way to get there. So it's called compromise. But we no longer allow compromise politically, and we also don't teach it. Because you're all looking at your phone, all the time, and you're reading things that you already agree with, you don't know how to compromise with guys who right across the table. Uh, because what, what we instead we do is say compromise is somehow a sign of weakness, right? Because you give up. You know, but it used to be a sign of courage and a sign of self-awareness. I'm aware enough of my strength and my abilities to know I can give up this 40%. You give up 40%. That leaves us with a little bit that we've got to figure out. We'll figure out how to get there and make a deal happen. These guys and women, just, and it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse because we don't, really, we don't even we don't know how to talk to each other. I see this now as a, as a college professor. This will be you, so I'm, I'm sorry if I'm sounding a little critical. Students don't talk. They don't like to talk. They want to text me. They want to email me. Right, they want to tweet at me, at one particular pesky student who knows on Twitter. So often it's when I don't respond to her email, so she just tweets it. I'm like, all right, I'll write that letter recommendation, whatever she needs. Right, that all, that's kind of lighthearted, but the problem is, I deal in American politics, these are divisive issues. These are complicated issues. And I have a, uh, increasingly, young people don't know how to talk about things that could create some conflicts, they're really uncomfortable doing that. I'd rather just read my tweets from people who I already agree with. It's a real dilemma. And we have members of Congress who take it to the extreme. So much so that if you, if you were to Google something like um, ISIS or Benghazi, it's a good one, right? Google ISIS or Benghazi. What I'm sure, and I hope that you already know, 
is that the search results that you get when you Google Benghazi have been pre-established for you based on all of your previous searches. So if you and I sit down together at two different computer terminals or just on our phone and Google Benghazi, the first five hits, potentially, are going to be very different. Because if you spend your day reading uh, uh, Fox News, reading the Wall Street Journal, and I spend my day reading MSNBC or the New York Times, the little genies that exist there, you know, they really are called, but technologically not as savvy as they could be, right? Uh, uh, have pre-fixed ideas that, that these are the kinds of things you read. So the first results that you get are going to be different than the results that I get. So even when you're objectively looking for information, the, the hits that you get are not the same. Not always, and it really depends on the person, but you know, we be, we've become a really good echo chamber. I read, or you can read the things you already are predestined to agree with. And you don't have to worry about the other stuff. That's why I strongly, strongly encourage my students, encourage you to please read the things that you know you don't. And read it. Control your blood pressure. Just read what people have to say. Listen to the other side. You don't need to agree. It's not a sign of weakness. But it is important to come to some kind of understanding of what people who disagree with you have to say. You're going to find a lot out there is trivial. Um, nasty, right? I have a colleague who I really admire, who really like. He's very smart, but he can't he can't get past some name calling every now and then. It's like that, that's not helpful. Like that MIT professor, right? Professor Gruber, from MIT, calling American people stupid. You know, first of all, it's for future politicians, don't say things you will regret when a camera is on. I just call the president a pejorative, so I'm sure I'm not taking my own advice. But uh, camera's on you. You call the American people stupid on multiple occasions, and you're the guy who helped draft the health care law, which you know is complicated and got personal to begin with. It doesn't take a brain to figure out that's going to be a problem at some point in the future. Okay? What bothers me is not that I say a lot of provocative things in the classroom to get a conversation going. It happens. Professors should be doing that. He's not your average professor. He actually helped craft healthcare law. So when you're thinking about colleges and universities, you're thinking about politics, I think it's okay to ask your future faculty, do you think the American people are stupid? Because I'm not sure I want to study from someone who comes at these positions with the idea that the people are stupid. And that explains a lot of the policy making process. I'd find that a little problematic if I were a student at MIT studying Professor Gruber's class. Yeah. Do you think the American people are stupid? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't. I say it right to the camera. I, I don't think the American people are stupid. I think there are always good individual examples of stupidity but you know, <laughs> and ignorance. I mean, right? It, that, that, we know that that's the case. But I, I, I kind of don't like painting with broad strokes, meaning Someone says something to me that is not smart or intelligent or intellectual or, or is stupid. But it takes a, a, a certain amount of hubris to think that explains everything. There are always those individual examples, and you shouldn't you shouldn't take that individual example or that anecdote and then use that to explain how people 300, 330 million people are stupid. I don't think that's what he believes, to be honest. Um, but when you say it over and over again, it, you do have to wonder. We, we make errors in judgment. We elect people who are less than capable. But that doesn't explain, you can't just say the American people are stupid and that explains it. By the way, um, I don't think they're stupid for reasons I, I said earlier. Why don't we participate? Is it because we're stupid or because we're busy? Think about your, your lives. I mean, why, why, we have three children. My wife and I both work. We have, we have a house, we have pets, we have sports with the kids on the weekends. We have all the things that you do, right? That is, that's exhausting enough. There are some nights where I just want to go home and binge on House of Cards because something I actually do because I really enjoy that. I don't pay attention to what's going on in the world. And I don't consider myself stupid. I consider myself someone who probably has a lot left to learn. But I get to spend my day thinking about this stuff. You're going to be a, a 
an engineer and you're spending your day thinking about engineering, you're not a stupid person because you're not spending your time thinking about public policy. And it does a real disservice to, to both the academy and the politics to suggest otherwise. Any last last question before I, I'll let you come back to your studies? You're all applying to, you think you're applying, are applying, going to be applying. How many of you want to study this? I don't take offense if the answer is not in a million years. I'm not thinking of it, maybe. Just make them feel better before I leave. <laughs> Possibly. What are you all thinking of studying? And I'm also good with, I'm not sure, because I'm not sure you need to be sure. History. History? Yeah. Anyone else? Not sure? Okay. No? <laughs> yeah. You really don't need to be sure. You, uh, I can tell you this. Like, I'm not the one. You're filling out your applications, and someone else is paying for it, so you've got to listen to that, surely. But um, I wouldn't get too wedded to any one thing early on. It's better to have it open mind. It, it really is. Yeah. Where did you attend college? I went to Catholic University in Washington for my undergraduate degree, and I got my PhD at Brandeis. My wife uh, got her bachelor's degree at Wheaton College in Norton, and got her master's degree in teaching at Simmons College in Did you know when you were going to college that this is what you wanted to do? I did not know that this is what I wanted to do. I knew what my interests were. So I knew when I was in high school that I was interested in politics. So I would have loved uh, an event like this. But I didn't know that I wanted to be a professor, and I kind of, uh, you know, I, I allowed myself to, to take my classes, to explore, to have fun, all the things that you do in college, and to kind of keep an open mind. I worked on a couple campaigns, uh, volunteered, and realized I didn't really like that very much. You know, um, I went to New Hampshire during one of the primaries and thought, why would someone want to go knocking on doors in New Hampshire? in February, in the cold. And the only thing that saved me from thinking I wouldn't go into politics at all was I was knocking on doors with people I didn't know. It was kind of fun, right? Um, but not really. It was cold. It was really cold. And so one of the addresses, you get these lists of addresses you have to knock on the door, was a, a, a convent of all places. And so we knocked on the door and this like 90-year-old nun came to the door and saw me and this person shivering with our you know, questionnaire and they invited us in for hot chocolate and cookies in this really warm, kind of rustic <laughs> convent where we stayed for the next like hour and a half and didn't knock on any more doors and just went back to the hotel and checked off all the things and turned them in. And I realized I'm probably not cut out for this, right? It's not my calling is to, to work on campaigns. Um, but I also, you know, like I was, I'd like to read, I'd like to read a lot, news, books. So, you know, I, I let that help me figure out the pathway. But there are times in graduate school when I thought, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I like teaching. And some faculty that you will encounter when you go to college uh, like research. And they're really good at it. And sometimes there's a, those things don't always come together nicely. And my hope is that you'll be patient and realize that part of the price that you pay for going to college and, and having really brilliant people in front of the room is sometimes they are the expert in the thing that they study, but they're not often as good as your as your high school teacher. So, you know, my passion was really to be in the classroom teaching and to read a lot. Um, that's what brought me here. You know, and I love college, I love higher ed. So, you know, I'm an administrator now and I really enjoy that. But it's complicated for you at your age bracket, it's a complicated often too complicated and too pressure-filled process, by my way of thinking, because there are really good colleges out there all across the spectrum, and it's uh, a matter of finding the right place for you. But if you're open to it, you can be a really wonderful experience. It's fun, it's stimulating, it's expensive, so don't goof off all the time. <laughs> uh, someone's paying these bills. But, um, my hope is that you don't find it too pressure-filled, because I think it's an unfortunate attribute of our modern life. We have, we have layered so many different pressures onto you at 18 years old. 
that it's not quite fair and it's not the best way to proceed. But if you go and you're open no matter where you go to the thing that you're interested in, the thing that you're passionate about, a couple things on that, you'll do better. If someone shoehorns you into a major that is not to your liking, you're not going to do very well and you're not going to be happy. Find a major that works for you, the thing that you're passionate about, and don't worry so much yet about what the outcome will be. You're going to do better, you're going to enjoy your classes, and you will spend money wisely. And you work on the outcomes, what you're going to do in that first job, when that is appropriate. But it is not appropriate now, because no one hires 18 year olds without a college degree. So, don't worry about that. Just a lot easier said than done, from my perspective. But it's if you get hung up on on that. Um, you're gonna, you'd be doing yourself a disservice. A lot of your, you're smart enough to know what your interests are. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.